1938, General Motors launched a diesel engine so simple and tough, it powered the Allied war machine, ran America's highways, and became an icon, until its legendary design backfired, costing the company everything. The diesel that bankrupted its own company is the story of how unstoppable success turned into corporate collapse. But what did GM's engineers overlook? And how did Detroit go from dominance to downfall? The answer begins with a single radical idea. In the late 1930s, diesel engines were the giants of industry. Massive, slow-turning machines built for ships and locomotives, not for the open road. General Motors saw a world on the brink of change. Trucks, buses, and military vehicles needed something different. A power plant that was compact, rugged, and easy to fix far from any factory. In 1938, GM formed the Detroit Diesel Engine Division under the guidance of Charles Kettering, an inventor known for believing that every engine should be simple enough to repair anywhere by anyone with basic tools. The challenge was clear. Existing diesels were too heavy, too complex, and too tied to the rail yards and shipyards that built them. America's roads, farms, and battlefields demanded a new kind of engine, one that could start in the cold, run on rough fuel, and keep going when maintenance was just a wrench and a can of oil. Kettering's team was given a mandate, design a diesel engine that broke the rules, one that could power not just machines, but the ambitions of a country. The urgency was real. War clouds gathered overseas, and industries at home needed reliable equipment to keep up with demand. The Detroit Diesel Project wasn't just about engineering. It was about preparing for a future that would test the limits of American industry. With that directive, the engineers set out to create a diesel engine unlike any the world had seen. One that would soon become the heartbeat of trucks, buses, and before long, the machinery of war. The Detroit Diesel Series 71 began with a radical departure from tradition. Instead of the heavy, four-stroke diesels that dominated factories and railroads, Kettering's team chose a two-stroke cycle. This design delivered power every time the crankshaft turned, doubling the firing rate compared to four strokes and producing instant torque at low speeds. To make that possible, the engine needed a constant supply of fresh air. The solution was the roots blower, a gear-driven air pump that forced air through the cylinders, clearing out exhaust and packing in oxygen for the next combustion. The blower's spinning lobes created a high-pitched whine, a sound that would later echo across highways and harbors as the unmistakable Detroit scream. Every detail aimed at reliability and simplicity. Instead of unique parts for each model, the Series 71 used a modular design. Each cylinder displaced exactly 71 cubic inches, and engines could be built in almost any configuration, inline or V-block, from 2 to 24 cylinders. Mechanics in the field could swap cylinder heads, injectors, or even entire blocks between engines, cutting down on downtime and keeping machines in service with only basic tools. If you're enjoying what you've seen so far, I hope you'll consider subscribing. It helps me preserve the history of these remarkable machines for future generations. Now, let's continue. The mechanical unit injector system, driven directly by the camshaft, delivered precise fuel to each cylinder without the need for complex, high-pressure lines. This approach balanced power, durability, and field repairability. The Series 71 wasn't just an engine. It was a blueprint for how machines could serve people in the toughest conditions. The distinctive sound of the roots blower, the ease of rebuilding, and the promise that any part could be replaced by hand all set the stage for the engine's legendary wartime reputation. Detroit diesel engines didn't just fill an order. They flooded the war effort with power. By 1944, production lines in Detroit were turning out up to 6,000 engines every month, with a workforce of over 4,000, many of them women. The numbers tell their own story. Nearly 193,000 Series 71 engines rolled out of the factories during World War II. On the front lines, these engines became the backbone of amphibious assaults and supply operations. More than 19,000 Higgins boats, those iconic landing craft, that carried troops to the beaches of Normandy, ran on Detroit Diesel 671s. 
LCMs and LCIs, the larger mechanized and infantry landing craft, relied on thousands more, each one pushing through salt spray and enemy fire. In armored warfare, the M4A2 Sherman tank used twin 671 engines in a single package, delivering better fuel economy and lower fire risk than gasoline-powered models. Over 22,000 Shermans with Detroit diesel powertrains served in both U.S. and Soviet hands, braving the cold of the Arctic convoys and the heat of North Africa. Tank destroyers like the M10 mounted these engines as well, counting on their reliability in the chaos of battle. Minesweepers and harbor tugs in the Navy's fleet depended on the same engines, with hundreds of vessels powered by 671 and 8V-71 models. Gray Marine, under license from Detroit Diesel, adapted thousands of engines for saltwater service, ensuring that landing craft and support ships could operate far from friendly ports. Away from the front lines, Series 71 engines powered tens of thousands of portable generators and field equipment, keeping communications and hospitals running in every theater. No other American engine matched this breadth of deployment. The Series 71 didn't just move machines, it moved armies, crossed oceans, and helped win a global war. Its reputation for starting under fire, running through mud and salt, and being fixed with a wrench in a foxhole made it an essential part of Allied logistics. On every front, the Detroit Diesel was there, its scream announcing the arrival of help or the next wave. Official records from the war years reveal just how rare mechanical failure was for these engines. In field service, Detroit Diesel's two strokes averaged less than one failure per thousand operational hours, a figure that set them apart from gasoline powered rivals. On the beaches of Normandy, in the freezing convoys to Murmansk, and across the Pacific, the Series 71 kept running through salt water, sand, and shell fire. These engines started when others stalled, shrugged off flooded bilges and frozen mornings, and could be patched up with a wrench and a handful of spare gaskets. Wartime maintenance logs from landing craft and tank battalions show engines running for over 2,000 hours before overhaul, a milestone that meant more supplies delivered, more wounded evacuated, and more bridges crossed under fire. For the men who depended on them, numbers only told part of the story. The sound of the roots blower, high and insistent, became a lifeline. One veteran, who landed at Omaha Beach in June 1944, later wrote, The scream was hope. It meant you weren't alone. In the chaos of battle, that mechanical howl cut through gunfire and surf, a promise that the engines would not quit before you did. Crews learned to trust the Detroit, even as bullets struck hulls or water poured into the bilge. If a cylinder head cracked or a fuel injector jammed, repairs could happen right on the beach, sometimes with nothing more than a hammer and determination. Mechanics swapped out parts in the mud, guided by the engine's modular design and the confidence that whatever broke, it could be fixed. This reputation for survival, measured both by hard statistics and by the memories of those who lived it, gave Detroit Diesel a status few machines ever achieve. The engines weren't just reliable, they were resilient in ways that shaped the outcome of battles and the fate of the men who fought them. That trust, forged under fire, would carry into peacetime and set the foundation for the engine's legendary status in the decades to come. By the 1950s, Detroit diesel engines were everywhere fleets needed reliability. The 671 and 8E71 models became staples of city transit and long-haul trucking. Greyhound buses crossing the continent, city transit fleets in places like Chicago and Los Angeles, and countless school buses all relied on the same green blocks of cast iron. Freight companies ordered trucks by the hundreds, often specifying Detroit power for their ability to run day and night with little more than oil and routine valve checks. Mechanics favored these engines for their modular parts, cylinder heads, injectors, even whole blocks could be swapped between models without special tools or factory support. In construction, cranes and bulldozers moved earth on major highway projects, their engines running at high idle for hours without complaint. On the water, tugboats and fishing vessels trusted the larger V-series 
where the low end torque needed to pull heavy loads or fight against river currents. No other diesel engine matched this reach. The sound of a Detroit at full throttle became the background noise of American progress, echoing through truck stops, city streets, and industrial yards. For the people who worked on them, the engines were more than just machinery. They were partners in the daily grind, designed to be fixed on the fly and trusted to get the job done. Even today, old service logs and faded fleet rosters tell the story. If a machine needed to run, chances were it ran on Detroit diesel. The Detroit diesel two-stroke didn't just power vehicles, it shaped a way of life. In shops and garages across the country, the routine of maintenance became almost a ritual. Mechanics learned to tune injectors by ear, to feel for the right tension on a valve, to swap a cylinder kit or blower in a parking lot, or along a muddy job site. The engine's modular construction meant that a part from a bus could fit a tugboat, a head from a truck could get a crane running again. This interchangeability wasn't just convenience, it built a community of problem solvers who took pride in keeping their machines alive with nothing but socket sets and grit. The sound of a Detroit at work became a backdrop to American life. That high-pitched whine, the so-called Detroit scream, echoed from city streets to river docks, from highway rest stops to construction sites. For drivers and operators, the noise was more than machinery. It was reassurance that the job would get done. Stories spread among truckers about 8V-71s pulling up mountain grades, their engines howling through the night, or fishermen in Alaska relying on 671s to get home through rough seas. The bond between people and machine ran deep, built on shared experience and trust. As the decades rolled on, Detroit Diesel expanded its family. The Series 53 arrived for smaller trucks and equipment, prized for its lighter weight and fuel economy. The massive Series 149, launched for mining and marine use, pushed out thousands of horsepower, while the Series 92 in the 1970s brought more power and the same field serviceable design. Each new engine kept the same philosophy, simple, strong, and always fixable. The engines weren't just tools, they were part of the American soundtrack, a link between hard work and the open road. By the late 1970s, the world Detroit diesel once dominated had turned hostile. Gas lines snaked through city blocks, and fuel prices doubled in just a few years, squeezing every fleet operator and independent trucker. Charts from that era show the cost of diesel spiking from 36 cents a gallon in 1973 to over a dollar by 1980. For engines built to run flat out, the new economics were punishing. At the same time, the Environmental Protection Agency began rolling out smoke tests and emission standards that the old two-stroke design simply could not pass. The very system that once gave Detroit diesels their power, the roots blower and ported cylinders, now let unburned fuel and oily smoke escape with every cycle. Black clouds trailed buses and trucks, leaving a visible mark on city air. EPA reports from 1977 flagged the Series 71 and 92 for excessive hydrocarbon and particulate emissions and local governments started enforcing noise ordinances that targeted the Detroit scream itself. In some cities, transit agencies faced fines if their fleets failed roadside smoke tests, and trucking companies scrambled to retrofit mufflers or risk being pulled off the road. Inside boardrooms, the pressure mounted. Competitors like Cummins and Caterpillar were pouring resources into cleaner, more efficient four-stroke engines with electronic controls. Their engines ran quieter, burned less fuel, and met new emissions laws with room to spare. Detroit Diesel's two-stroke, once the standard for reliability, now looked like a liability on the balance sheet. Engineers debated costly redesigns, but the math rarely worked. Each fix added weight, complexity, or cost, and often did not bring the engines into full compliance. By the end of the decade, the writing was on the wall. The same qualities that once made the Detroit diesel unbeatable, mechanical simplicity, raw power, and that unmistakable sound had become the very reasons it was being regulated out of existence. The company faced a choice, adapt at enormous expense, or give up the market it once owned. In 1988, the Detroit diesel division faced a crossroads. 
after years of struggling to adapt its classic two-stroke engines to new emissions laws and rising fuel costs, General Motors made a decisive move. The company sold Detroit Diesel to Penske Corporation, ending half a century of GM stewardship. Inside the Redford, Michigan plant, the news landed heavily. Union newsletters from that summer captured a sense of pride mixed with anxiety. Workers watched as the last of the old two strokes left the line, uncertain what the future would bring. With new ownership came a new direction. Penske's leadership, guided by both market pressure and regulatory deadlines, pushed Detroit Diesel's engineers to break from tradition. The goal was clear, design an engine that could not only meet the latest environmental standards, but also compete with the electronic sophistication of rival brands. The result was the Series 60, a four-stroke diesel that abandoned the mechanical simplicity of its predecessors in favor of electronic controls and precise fuel injection. The Series 60 launched with features that would have been unthinkable in the era of the 671. Its electronic management system adjusted timing and fuel delivery in real time, cutting emissions and boosting efficiency. For the first time, Detroit Diesel offered an engine that could pass the toughest EPA tests without sacrificing power or reliability. Early production models rolled out in 1987 and quickly gained a following among fleet operators who needed to comply with new regulations but still demanded durability on the road. This shift was more than a technical update. It was a fundamental change in engineering philosophy. The Series 60 showed that Detroit Diesel could adapt using microprocessors and sensors where wrenches and feeler gauges once ruled. For many longtime employees and mechanics, the new engine brought mixed feelings. The mechanical soul of Detroit Diesel, the ease of field repairs, the signature sound, gave way to the quiet confidence of electronic precision. Yet the company survived, and for a time, the Series 60 restored Detroit's reputation as a leader in heavy-duty power. The legacy of the two-stroke era lived on, but the future now belonged to a new kind of diesel. In 1938, GM's Detroit Diesel division set out to build an engine that was simple, durable, and repairable anywhere. A mission that would shape more than a million Series 71s across war and peace. The archival records confirm its unmatched reliability. Less than one failure per thousand hours during World War II. Yet as emissions and fuel regulations tightened in the late 1970s, documents show the very features that made the two-stroke engine legendary became liabilities leading to GM's 1988 sale of the division. While Detroit Diesel's internal reports detail efforts at modernization, the full story behind some corporate decisions remains sealed in company archives. Today, thousands of these engines still run, maintained by mechanics drawn to their rebuildable design. The evidence is clear. Detroit Diesel's two-stroke engines transformed American industry and defense, and their legacy endures in machines and communities that refuse to let this chapter of engineering history fade. Thank you for watching. If you had the chance to work on one of these, or if you remember hearing that distinctive sound, I'd be genuinely interested to hear your story in the comments. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please do subscribe.